Aloha, and thank you for joining us on the Cyber Underground, where our mission is to dig deep to find out how cybersecurity touches all of us in our everyday lives. I'm your host, Dave Stevens, and with me today we have, again, our exceptional co-host, Mr. Andrew Lanning. Andrew, the security guy. Aloha, uh, everybody. Welcome back. Happy and we've got a Thanks, great brother. guest for you today, uh, Dan Yaozi from the PMI Honolulu chapter. And What's welcome. PMI? No acronyms. No, we've got to use PMI for now. We're going to get back. Right. Well, so, everybody, i got to do uh, some due diligence here. This is a spin-off show from, uh, from Hibachi Talk. So, uh, Andrew Landing here shout is usually the co-host here. And we're going to do a shout-out to Hibachi Talk and Mr. Yeah. Gordon Bruce. We Gordon miss you, Gordon. Tech and uh, he, you guys had a show this, this, uh, this Wednesday? Oh, Heather, Heather Patterson was on talk, and she does um, happiness, talent, uh, like development, right? So then, you know, if you got to work, you might as well be happy and, and how to make it happy. And she works with, you know, like one-on-ones, but she also does teams, you know, yeah. goes in and kind of that 360 view, of, you know, why I like you, why I don't like you, whatever it may be, and helps people work on, you know, being happier at work, right? Because that's where we spend a lot of time. So that, really, that is so she important. was so fun. Yeah, the, the productivity must be fantastic when she comes in and helps people out. Because sure. if you're depressed at your job, you're horrible at your job, probably. Sure. And you're terrible. And 70% of people are disengaged. Oh, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And now that we add the internet at work, it, we're, it's even worse. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Disengage. Right? That's why we have to have project managers to, to re engage us, to get re our work done. Us, right, there's, right. there's that plug. See, I brought that right back. Was that that nice? a good flow. I like that. <laughs> Bring it right back to Dan. Now, Dan, you're the uh, president of the Project Management International chapter in Honolulu. Yep. Can you tell us a little bit about? Project Management International. What's its history and a little bit about its mission? So the, the Project Management Institute is a, a national organization. It's a not-for-profit. We uh, have about 2.9 million um, members. Wow. And we really espouse the benefits of project management in the organization and the project management profession. Um, so of those 2.9 million, there's about 650,000 accredited PMP uh, certified project managers. Uh, the local chapter here in Honolulu, we actually have over 600 members. Um, so a good portion, uh, and you know we have a number of events every month. We've got breakfast, lunch, kahanas, and in August we actually have our uh, annual professional development day, which is a full day event. We have speakers come in from the mainland and talk about project management and the, the principles, um, tools, techniques to use to effectively manage you know, projects and organizations. Now before we get into cybersecurity and, and security in general, why is project management important to a company? Just in general, why, why would I, as a company owner, want a project manager to come in and manage a project when I think I've got this handled? I know what needs to be done. And I made that mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, Andrew owns, uh, he's uh, the co founder of Integrated Security Technologies, mm -hmm. a security company here. He has physical security, right? Yep. And so you made the mistake. When we moved when we moved our offices and did the build out, I yeah. used to do construction before I ever went in the Navy or anything. I was like, ah, oh, you got it's this a handled. small job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can handle this. Right. Oh my gosh. If it wasn't for a, a wonderful G C who put up with me and it's still re permitting took three times as long as you ever planned, right? Like nightmare. Uh, so if you, so you need a to hire a manager. project manager, yes. So project manager, Definitely. what do you what, what's your value? What's your added value to an organization? Okay, so uh, let's start out with a definition of a project, right? So right. a project is a temporary endeavor. It's got a defined start date and end date, mm. right? So right. you know exactly what your scope is going to be. And so what we try to do is manage projects, you know, with the triple constraints. So you have your scope, you have your schedule, and you have your cost. And so scope is, is what you're going to do. Exactly. Like, you, and outside of those boundaries is not included in your project. So Absolutely. that's your that's you called your scope, scope gap. <laughs> yeah. Scope creep, right? You just creep. Well, that's creep if you do it. It's yeah. gap if you identify it before you do it. Exactly. <laughs> so so the reason organizations undertake projects is, you know, a new service, a new product, they want to make a change, right? Hmm. So project managers right. ultimately are change agents within an organization. And so it's either to bring a new product to market, a new service to market, or to actually um, accommodate a, a strategic goal of the organization. So Project managers in general really have to be attuned to dealing with dynamic uh, environments, lots of change going on. They have to be the advocate for the project, and they have to be able to communicate with different people, you know, all the way from your C-suite down to the lowest level technician who's working C-suite, so the, the chief operating officer, exactly. chief executive officer, all those, those C. So right. in, in uh, Honolulu, though, we have a lot of LLCs. Mm -hmm. So you might not see a lot of those C-suite people, but they'd be directors and principals in a company, right? And they're the people that, they're your stakeholders in the project and also the champions. 
Right. 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 So you have to have their sign off to get them going. Right. They exactly. sometimes act like champions. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes the changes they want to bring to you midstream, right, are, are right. they don't understand the impacts of that. So right. They're the dreamers oftentimes. So you yeah. get to be the champion of change management. I like how he said he advocates for the project. I think that's really important because the project needs someone that has that start and end date in mind. And when you run project without proper project management or someone that understands that, that's how you get craziness. Especially when you've got a final delivery, right? You've sure. got a, a date that you must deliver a project on and some change gets made that's going to push that deadline out. No, absolutely. You've got so, to inform those people, hey, this is not going to work. Mm -hmm. Or if it does, here's the result. And, and that's exactly it. And when I mentioned the triple constraint, right? So if midstream, the project sponsor wants to extend the scope and add new functionality to the system, you need to throw more money at it. So you have to affect your budget or you need to put more people on it. So that affects your resources and your timeline. So that's the role of the project manager is actually to navigate that, that kind of minefield and, and work with the project sponsor and the stakeholders to you know, really message that out and say, okay, you want to make this change, here are the impacts. If you're okay with those impacts, you know, let's do the proper change management procedure, get it signed off, and, and we'll move forward. And the important thing he said there was that it's going to cost more. They don't hear that part. They, you know, they, <laughs> not usually. Not usually. And, they're like, and they're like, they want to know right now, right? right they want right. to make the change. Yeah. So there's this, there's this speed, and you're like, well, we need to estimate. Me. And so, okay, give me a ROM, right? So mm -hmm. give me a, an idea. Right, ROM, right. what do you think a ROM is in your experience? 60 70%? Something usually, like that. It's kind of, it might be 80, but man, you know, you need, you know, you say, what's well, between a million and two million? They're like, ah, it's not a good guess. It's not yeah. even a good guess. Actually, it might be. It might be, yeah, yeah. ROM is usually plus or minus 20 to 30 percent. And what does the ROM yeah. stand for? The rough order of magnitude. Rough order of magnitude. So yeah. there's, there's different, you can get closer and closer to a more precise number, but the ROM is usually pretty loose. Exactly. Right? It's your first. Wild ass guess. Yeah. Well, like when people say yeah. you, can, you can do X by square footage, right? So if we want to add a 50 square foot, we ought to know what it is. But maybe there's a concrete wall in the way. Like, you know, sometimes there's just constraints that make it. Exactly. Know. So typically the way, the way it'll work is when you initiate the project, the very first phase, you're, you're kind of going through and defining the high level tasks that need to be done. What are the deliverables and the milestones that you want to accomplish? And that's where you come in with your budgetary estimate. You're wrong, right? Mm. And then once the, the project sponsor, you know, signs off on that and says, okay, we're good with this, that's where the project manager kind of steps in with the technical experts, breaks it down task by task as granular as we can. We assign, you know, what are, what are the resources needed, what are the materials needed, and that's where you have your, your hard costs. So you can kind of hone in on what your actual cost is going to be for the project. And when it comes to execution phase, that's where you're tracking against, you know, here's the schedule we set, here's the budget we set, and you're, you're really working to monitor and control that throughout the project to make sure you, you actually do satisfy those constraints. I like that you, you mentioned navigation because I, I picture doing a project without a project manager, especially when it's a big project, it's not, kind of like taking your ship out in the open ocean and saying, I kind of want to go to Fiji, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm not going to yeah. navigate. You know, I'm just going to go, I, I know kind of where it is. I've been there before. That's called right. drifting. <laughs> <laughs> not Hopefully the currents that. take you there, right? But once you get there, you're out of food, you're, you know, you're starving to death, you've maybe eaten a couple members of your crew. I don't know. Yeah. So bad things can happen wow. without a project management. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, there's, you. and there's some good stats here, too, actually. Um, the PMI has been working with the U.S. government, actually, to work on some legislation. And at the end of last year, they passed the Program Management Improvement and Accountability Act. And what the government actually recognized was for every $1 billion spent in U.S. programs and projects, there's about $97 million that's in weight. Wow. Uh, so it's a significant amount. Of that. You're talking 10% there. So really what this uh, act did is set a progression path for you know, program and project management through the U.S. government. So there's actually career development tracks now. And buy-in for government executives who are leading these programs and projects to actually be certified. Um, through some professional organization. I'm, I'm glad you brought it's that important. up. Uh, so yeah. you guys are um, mostly talking about the PMP, Project Management right. Professional Certification that the PMI mm -hmm. is the, the host of, right? Um, I, I know a couple of DOD contractors that I'm, I'm working with now, they have to have a PMP to do their next project, otherwise yeah. they cannot do the next project. Yeah. It is a requirement now, just like uh, DOD professionals that are in the network, um, you know, NMCI, something like that. The secure networks, they have to have a Security Plus or CISSP certification from ISC2 or CompTIA. Now to do a project, you need to have the PMP. Yeah. Why is that so important? So, what does the PMP give us? You know, that, that's a great question because, you know, really that's the foundation of PMI. The PMI actually comes with the standards and guidelines, tools, techniques to use 
um, for project management. It also establishes a common vernacular. So project manager or project manager, you can speak the same language. You know, so we're talking about the, the project management body of knowledge, or the PMBOK, PM, PMBOK. PMBOK. Right, he's so, got all kind of acronyms. I mean, all he's got, he's so got all these acronyms. Stuff, yeah, know, right? <laughs> Good job. Good well, job. I got the PMP. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you, you read this book, the Pimbach, which, mm -hmm. by the way, is better than a sleeping pill. It's you really, it really got to take it in little chunks. It's just two pages and don't yeah. wham. Okay. It's uh, yeah. It, it's not the most entertaining reading in the world. Exactly. But when you consume it and apply that knowledge. It's fantastic knowledge, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to the communication between, say, you're hosting the project, you're my champion, you want this project done, I'm the project manager. My communication with you becomes infinitely easier oh, yeah. if I follow these processes. So can you, can you talk about how the PMP is broken down and what would I have to do to get a PMP? What do I have to know? Okay, so to obtain the PMP certification, you actually have to have some uh, boots on the ground experience working in projects, not necessarily as a former formally named project manager, but at least working with different sections, right? So they have different knowledge areas, um, which they look at and say, okay, you know, you spent some time in these areas. You also need some contact time. So 35 contact hours um, with a recognized education provider about project management. And then once you meet those two guidelines, then you um, basically apply to take the exam. And once you're accepted to take the exam, you can sit and uh, sit through the PMP exam, which is always fun. Going to your point about the PMBOK, um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend people just trying to read the PMBOK, <laughs> you know, cover to cover and trying to sit and take the test. Yeah, because, warm piece. It's <laughs> yeah, it's warm piece. But, but really, it's, it's sitting for the exam, it's more contextual based. So they provide you scenarios and you have to pick the best answer. And so going through some kind of boot camp or PMP uh, preparation course, is infinitely better than trying to read the PMBOK because it actually puts everything in context. The PMBOK are the tools and techniques. The training, the, the, the courses, and the reason that 35 hours are required is because it puts everything in context. It gives you those scenarios where it would be appropriate to use these tools and not necessarily these other tools. Right, so now that's 35 contact hours mm -hmm. can be a number of different ways you can get those, right? You can get those online, there's uh, certified vendors, mm -hmm. right? And college courses. I know when I went for the PMP, because I'd taken a course in project management as a 16-week course, there was 36 contact hours. Oh. So I, it qualified me as that part of the qualification for the exam. Can you break down the knowledge areas and maybe how those are broken down into the PMP? What are the different pieces of the puzzle? So there's a number of them. So you have the, um, the initiating, communications. Um, it goes through all the different. And what are those the called? The, there's five of those, right? What are those called? Well, so you have the, the process groups. Process so you have group. You're initiating, you're planning, uh, you're executing, you're monitoring, controlling, and you're and closing. And closing, yeah. Right. Okay, and then under that, you and have under knowledge those, areas. And each of those, you apply your knowledge areas, and you're going to give me a PMP exam. He's going to pop a question. <laughs> yeah, There's yeah. over 100 of these, and you oh, have wow. to, when, yeah. when you're prepping for the exam, you have to, maybe you put those, those five at mm -hmm. the top, and then you have to put all the knowledge areas underneath. You have to hand write them to make sure you know them. I see. And, and one of the tricks in the test, you get to go in there with a blank piece of paper yeah. and just do a quick brain dump. Sure. And write down as many as you can, so then you know some of the questions on, right. the, on the exam. You can just, and there's formulas, mm -hmm. right? There's so I, I used to teach cost management for the PMP prep. Yeah, That's one of the worst cost management. You have to memorize <laughs> formulas, you know. What's this gonna affect down the road, pretty much? That's how that, that's cost management. What, what, was, what is it that you've been teaching at PMP Prep? You've done the PMP Prep courses. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about how the PMI promotes this in Honolulu? No, absolutely. So PMI Honolulu chapter actually uh, has three to four different PMP Prep exams each year. And basically we sit down and we have volunteers actually teach the course who have recently sat through the PMP exam. So they know what it's going to look like. So they know yeah. what, it, what it's going to look like. They've been through the test recently. You know, and, and it, it's a win-win for everyone because to maintain your certification, you need to earn PDUs, professional development units. And so for every volunteer hour, you get one PDU. Mm, and right. so the, oh. the... Otherwise, you've got to take the test every three years. That's nice. Right. It's a giving back, though. I like that. Right. It's, it's giving back to the sure. profession, right? And that's yeah. one of the key tenets of PMI is volunteerism. Right, and that's what they're trying to promote. So basically, you have these instructors go through the different knowledge areas and, and basically teach you know, what you're going to see in the exam and make sure that students can understand and, and apply the, those concepts. Um, you also, the way the PMI Honolulu chapter structures it, if you become a member of PMI and the chapter, you actually get that amount of discount off of the PMP prep course. 
So it, it, it's win-win. You become a member, it's a great organization, 600 members, so we have a lot of networking events. Right. Um, and you, you get exposure to all those tools, techniques, and you're able to sit for the exam. And I, I know it's also awesome. knowing all those other PMPs, if you, if you build your network within the PMI, you have visibility into many different companies in the islands. Sure. You know how those companies are doing business. And most importantly, and we'll talk about this after the break, you have exposure to their lessons learned. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to necessarily make all the same mistakes to learn the lesson. You can go get it from them. Right. They did the similar project. Here's what we ran into, and we'll talk about that after the break. Awesome. So we're going to pay some bills. Uh, we'll be right back. I'm going to the game, and it's going to be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink, but won't be drinking today because I'm the designated driver, and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line, keeps them from drinking too much so we can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way because it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you want to be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O, and I'm the guy that says, let's go. Hey, Andrew, the security guy here with the Cyber Underground, Dave and Dan in the house. I wanted to talk about something real quick that I keep seeing in town. Listen, if you're not a retail organization, there's really no reason for your doors to be unlocked to the public. So take a look at your organization, take a look at the traffic that's moving around, and see if there's not a vulnerability there that you can protect your employees from by adding some access control to that front door. I know you don't want to use a key all the time. I know it's inconvenient, so maybe some electronic access control. But more and more of these incidents that we see, people are just walking in and wreaking havoc, and you don't want that to happen to your staff. So that's my security minute. Take a look at access control to help keep your employees safer. Back to project management. <laughs> Back to project management. That's a good tip, uh, keeping your, your front door locked if you don't have to deal with the public. Yeah, why? Yeah, why, the, why would I you do it? I walk indoors all the time. Like, why? <laughs> really, why? So anybody can walk in, good and bad. Yeah. It's a, yeah, yeah. You can get flowers yeah. delivered or you can get some paint. We're, we're such a trustworthy you know, state. Everybody that's the Aloha open, way, right? We but, just don't think about that. Things are changing. And, now, wait a minute. When you, when you grew up, grew up uh, Kentucky? Yeah. Okay. Did you lock your front door at night? No. That, it just wasn't the thing you did. You don't I, lock I, anything. I grew up in California, it was the same thing. Yeah. And we didn't start doing that until like, the 80s or the 90s when crime started getting kind of bad. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, it, it's a different for me, culture. Probably, now. probably like high school or something. So, yeah, definitely like 81, 80, in the 80s. Yeah, yeah early 80s. Before so. I remember like, like being worried about locking, yeah. the, locking your car. We didn't, nobody cared. Yeah, you just throw the keys on sure the front so. and uh, on the front uh, yeah. floor by the, by the car seat so you always remember where they are. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and the culture changed on us. We just shifted all of a sudden. Now we got to lock our cars. We got to lock crack. our doors. It's the crack epidemic just <laughs> changed. Scarface, all that stuff. Everybody, That's went, right. everybody we got went crazy, wanted to be a gangster. You know? Cheaper, better drugs, and now yeah. better crime. I guess, uh, actually, we just, a lot did, of drugs we just didn't manage crime. it well, is what I think we might find out. You know, had we, had we brought that stuff in and managed it a little better, we might have made some money and not had such a crime wave out of it. What do you think, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> Way in from a yeah, yeah, absolutely. from a management perspective. <laughs> Dude, we just didn't, that's a big we just didn't get into the inner cities quick enough to help manage this process. You that's know? right. We needed guys it, it, like you. It got out of hand. <laughs> so what were we talking about? We got to get back to uh, project management. Uh, what were we covering? We got to get back to a couple things. We're navigating your project. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to talk about how valuable it is to have a project manager on a project to keep costs in line. You know, there's one thing we, sure. as company owners, uh, are terrified of dumping a whole bunch of money into a project and A, not completing it, or B, completing it late and nobody wants it then, mm -hmm. or getting your project to market too late and just spending all that money, it's useless, sure. right? So when, you, when you, put a, you dedicate some money to a project, why is it so much more valuable to bring a project manager in? How do you help that process? Well, actually, it's twofold. So let's let's take it one step back. So if you've identified a need, mm -hmm. right? That's right. you're really talking about business analysis, right? So the PMI actually offers the PMI BA, the project management 
business analyst certification as well. And that really goes to the looking at what are the driving factors? What are the requirements? What's the concept here? You know, let's go through and, and document what the business requirements are. What the, and then we drive into the technical specification. That really kind of helps define what the issue is, right? And what the value to the business is. And then the project manager comes in and actually goes and says, okay, this is a good plan. We've, the project sponsor says, you know, we want to go with this. And now it's time to execute. And so we plan it out and execute. And so by and large, the recent statistics say projects that have a project manager assigned to it are about two and a half times more successful than those without. Yeah. Now that's probably Success the, being on time and on budget. Exactly. Right. You know. And hopefully under budget and delivering early. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're a really good project manager, maybe you could yeah, that's make rare. that happen. That's rarer in my experience. So but, project you know, managers have this tendency deadlines. to do uh, uh, tasks in tandem. They right. realize that two tasks can happen at the same time. When you do some really good analysis, you realize these two things don't have to be in sequence. They can be at the same time. Well, so I have some experience with that. So we're, we're a, a, you know, a low voltage contractor, right? And oftentimes we're well down the totem pole on a large project, say a build out of a, of a facility. And if the project manager is not f familiar with perhaps the tasks that a low voltage contractor has to perform and hasn't come up in the, me the weekly meetings or whatever meetings you're having, yeah, he'll schedule uh, us in there to do our work the same day flooring's going in. Well, you can't have ladders can't out. Yeah, yeah. So things like that occur or the... You know, the frame, when you're dropping in a frame, for example, into a wall, well, we need to get our wire into that frame that day, right? Or, or the, if we're not there, the guys will put the frame in and clip the wire off, so now it's cut. Like, so, so, because he doesn't, he doesn't know our, our particular industry, for example. So it's not a, really a failing, it's just that you gotta have that vocabulary, you gotta know, you know, from your subs what's gonna happen if you're like the overall PM. You know, sometimes there's multiple PMs on projects, but So we it's saw that problem you know, with uh, subject matter experts. SMEs. Yeah, SME, sure. Right. So you would call in a subject matter expert, hopefully, if you didn't know the industry as well as you should. No, exactly. Right. And so that, that's really an important distinction that, sure. that was brought up here because when you look at projects, if you're executing a project in an LLC, a small company, right, chances are the project manager has really risen from the technical rank, right? They were promoted into management because they were the subject matter expert and because the company is really trying to execute a narrowly focused solution, right? That's well within the, the auspices of what that subject matter expert understands. But when you deal with complex projects like construction, yeah. the project manager is not necessarily an expert in construction. You know, in those scenarios, the project manager really needs to be more focused on bringing in who the subject matter experts are in a collaborative fashion to actually orchestrate, okay, here's what we're going to do in order, right? It's two very different skill sets. And it really depends on the size of the company as well as the projects that you're trying to accommodate. Yeah, and there's, um, if you get a chance to look at what Hart has mapped out, the Gantt charts oh, right. for the rail. I would imagine those our are beach changing. Here, our beach here looks, well, it was a beach, I mean, I don't know, yeah. it's a digital, but this studio, it's huge. They, they have 60 linear feet of wall space covered from floor to ceiling, API with Gantt charts. Mm -hmm. It's stunningly really? complex. <laughs> like, whoa. I would imagine that that changes a lot too, right? That might even yeah. just be phase one. <laughs> it, exactly, right? Well, it's, oh, gosh. Well, what did the what did the H three take? Twenty years? I don't know. Yeah, yeah I too I long. shudder to think uh, what it was like then. to work on that <laughs> on that project. <laughs> Me too. I was a kid. Uh, <laughs> what it was it like to work on that project? But I think the rail's going to end up being something like that too. And you know what I see, it, unfortunately, is um, in the technical field. So I did twenty years of IT contracting mm -hmm. before I went into teaching, and then. I, what I find out is that IT project managers are rarely from the IT ranks. Is that right? Rarely. Huh. And they depend heavily on business analysts mm -hmm. who usually come up specifically from those IT ranks. Huh. So if you're looking for a uh, business analyst and databases, there's somebody who's done Oracle for 10 years oh, and I can see. give that you an exact me. cost. We need this many cores, this licensing, we need to implement it this way. We can do these many things in the cloud, but these can't be cloud. And here's our backup rotation. Mm -hmm. All those things that the project manager needs to know, but they don't know because they didn't come out of the IT field. And I think uh, mostly because I'm one of the few guys in the IT field that ever went for that certification. Mm -hmm. Most of us find that a little boring. Right. But until you actually do some project management, you're not going to know how challenging project management can oh, actually yeah, be. Exactly. It can be a mind twister. And the, here's, the, here's the worst part about my project management experience. Lessons learned. 
I had to make all these mistakes over and over and over. And every time I did, we'd have a little after action report. Here's the lessons learned. Let's not do that again. Let's put that in our next project, right? Mm -hmm. But I didn't build my network so I could learn from other project managers. Mm. Whereas we have over 600 project managers okay. in the state, right? Absolutely. So we could network those lessons learned. How do you bring lessons learned into your projects? Well, and, and so really the lessons learned, the historical knowledge, can demonstrate the maturity of an organization. Because mm, if right. you go into mm. an organization and you, don't, and you see that there's no lessons learned in their project management practice, then typically they're a, you know, an immature organization. They really need to, to work through that. Whereas more mature organizations have that documented lessons learned database from multiple project managers. And so now you can search through it and say, okay, I'm going to do a project this size and scope, these technologies, you know, and look at the lessons learned so you don't have to repeat those. Now, in, in speaking to the networking uh, abilities of our chapter, you know, it's really not uncommon for people, you know, in the different fields, so construction versus IT versus um, hospitality, you know, t talk to one another and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm working on this project. I have these concerns. What do I need to look out for? Right, and that's mm. that's where that networking really comes to play in the organization is sharing those lessons learned and, and sometimes even you know templates, tools, and, and techniques too to say, you know, look for for this construction portion. Even though you're working on an IT project for the construction portion, here's what you need to watch out for. Right, uh, that's where all your networking events mm -hmm. come into play and your professional de development day. What exactly. what day exactly? I thought it was in September. It's in August this year. Typically, it's September, but we yeah. moved it up to August 17th. Okay, uh, so it opens doors open at 7 a.m. Okay, just to wrap up our last minute, mm -hmm. how does the PMP certification differ from, say, the new CompTIA Project Plus certification, mm -hmm. which just came out? I mean, it doesn't have, right. you came out in the 80s, right? Mm -hmm. Early 90s. Not Dan himself, but no, no. no. Actually, <laughs> didn't you come out in the 80s? You're a young guy. <laughs> so how does this different, different, uh, differentiate from the CompTIA certification? So as a professional organization, we really focus on you know, the different core tenets. We have a code of ethics, we have, you know, the different practices, the standards, the common vernacular. So we really established all of these things as an organization. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I'd have to look through my notes, but I think it's 1967 is when PMI was actually initially 67? And then wow. 1997 is when the Honolulu chapter was actually founded. So we're wow. under 20 years now. Wow, that's, awesome, that's a long right? time. So whereas uh, organizations like CompTIA, you know, they really come out with, they try to make it step by step, you know, do this, then this, then this. It's like PMP light. Yeah. PMP light. PMP is one of the hardest tests you can take. It, I've heard it was that a from four hour many, test. many people. Yeah. It was a couple hundred questions. Yeah. yeah. Shouldn't um, scare you off. It <laughs> shouldn't scare you off. Yeah. Um, it's it's going to be it. a really required. Um, uh, so, the, the cybersecurity, the reason I call this a cyber mm -hmm. superpower, right? Cybersecurity, the projects in cybersecurity, even on offensive tests, you go through the five attack phases. You have to recon, you have to scan, you have to gain and maintain access, and then cover your tracks. Especially with covering tracks, if you're not putting down lessons learned, right. you're going to keep making the same mistakes over and over again. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to have someone like you in the organization. How long did it take you to study for and gain your, your PMP? Uh, so I actually got my master's in project management back in 2003. Oh. And wow. then I got certified in about 2007, 2008. Time frame. Well, a little bit. Yeah. A little bit of time. Wow. wow. Hey, thanks for being here, guys. We're yeah, going to have to wrap up the show. Dan, yep. thank you so much. Thank you. Aloha, sir, and I will Aloha. see you soon. I'll be All here right. next week, Dan. Thanks All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Aloha, everybody. Stay safe. <laughs>